Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to live home in the community, Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Park Chester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Abel on Air has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists. Welcome to this edition of Able to Learn Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently abled. I've always been your host, Lauren Seiler. Okay, and on this edition today, we will focus on celiac disease. But before we do that, we would like to um, thank our sponsors, Washington County Mental Health, Green Mountain Support Services, and many others, including the part, uh, today's partner, um, the National Celiac Association. Um, we would like to welcome the National Celiac Association to Ableton On Air. Thank you very much, Carla, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, her name is Carla Carter. Uh, you're the, can you, uh, what is your title? Sure, yes, my title is the Director of Outreach and Programming with the National Celiac Association. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, tell me, Tell me a little about yourself and the organization, the National Celiac Association. Yes, so personally, um, I've had celiac disease for over 22 years. I'm actually from Vermont and was diagnosed right in Berlin, Vermont um, when I was in college, which is aging me. So quickly after, because it is a genetic disease, which I'll be going into a, a little later, my sister was diagnosed um, and six or so years later, my brother. My husband and I have two children and we are blessed um, to have them. Our 10 year old actually was diagnosed at age two. So we, there are four of us in the family. So that's uh, a bit of my personal background with the disease. And uh, the National Celiac Association exists basically to help people live every day with celiac disease and related conditions because there are a lot of related gluten sensitivities, mm -hmm. um, including non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So um, basically it's our mission to help people uh, be their best selves when, from various age ranges, from pediatrics to adults, seniors and everything in between, so. Okay, when you say celiac disease and other challenges within that, what exactly is celiac? Uh, can you define celiac? And then let's go from there. Sure, yeah. So celiac disease, as I mentioned, is genetic. It is an autoimmune condition. So similar to diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, celiac disease, um, the body attacks itself when it doesn't recognize gluten as a protein in the body. Um, and so it happens all in the lining of the small intestine. 
when people eat gluten, the body, for some reason, says, I don't know what that is, it's a foreign invader, we need to get rid of it. And so what results is the damage to the lining of the small intestine. And from that point on, it affects the, abil the ability to absorb nutrients, mm -hmm. which there in turn can affect the entire body. There are over 200 symptoms of celiac disease, uh, ranging from the typical gut-related symptoms um, um, I apologize for interrupting. Explain what do you mean gut? Uh, can you explain what do you, you mean in the stomach area, correct? So your gut, the, the, the gastrointestinal tract um, is very long and it includes different parts. So the part um, that affects celiac disease is actually the small intestine. Okay. So that's where the damage occurs. And what really causes celiac disease? like the, the main cause. Um, go ahead. So we're still learning about that. Uh, basically, as I mentioned, the genes, there are two genes. And uh, about a third of the population has one of those genes. But a very small subset, about 4%, goes on to develop the disease. So science is still trying to figure out what turns on that gene. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of potential causes. I just got back from the International Celiac Disease Symposium in Italy a couple of month, uh, weeks ago, and there's a whole lot of talks about the potential causes. So there's a lot of research still going on about that. Um, uh, Arlene, did you want to ask any questions right now? Go ahead. Um, Take your time. This is so important for someone to see us to eat gluten-free products. I'm going to rephrase her question. Is it, is it so important for someone with celiac disease to really eat gluten-free products or stay away from gluten? So the only treatment right now is a strict gluten-free diet. Okay. That, that's... Um, Strict being the operative word because with celiac disease, it's basically the body kicks off an autoimmune response when it's down to about 10 milligrams mm -hmm. um, of exposure to gluten. And that's an approximate amount. But if you take a piece of bread and you chop it up into 350 pieces, mm -hmm. one of those pieces would be approximately about 10 milligrams. And that's the part where um, people, generally speaking, start that autoimmune response. So whether they feel it or not, it's happening in their body. So, mm. um, so let's... Uh, kind of backtrack and go, because uh, you want to talk about a lot of stuff, um, mm -hmm. which is great. Um, processed foods, which is a problem. See, here in Vermont, we tend to eat a lot of fresh uh, foods, but for those who don't or can't afford fresh food, it is a problem, especially with, probably a problem with... Um, with uh, gluten-free. So um, is it a problem with gluten-free with uh, the processed market being like, you said uh, off camera, you had told me that the FDA, in order for it to be gluten-free, uh, the factory needs to do something to their process. How does that work? It Am I saying it right? Am I saying it right? Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, so um, just for the listeners, I want to back up just even more, if I could, just yes, to explain what gluten is. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Um, no, 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 that's okay. It's, these are great questions. And um, I just want to make sure uh, everybody understands because gluten and gluten-free is like a huge hot button topic in today's times. And, but a lot of people don't understand what gluten actually is. So it's a protein that's found in wheat, barley, and rye. And a lot of other grains are contaminated or have cross contact with glu those gluten-containing grains. So we have to be very careful with things like oats as well. 
um, so that when people ingest those proteins. So um, in addition, we also have to worry about things like cross contact. So if you know, we have to worry about different you mean uh, cross contamination, correct? So cross contamination is, is you bring up a great point, um, Larry. Larry or Lawrence? I'm sorry. L Lawrence is fine. Lawrence is great. Lawrence. Um, so cross contamination actually refers to bacteria, and cross contact refers to food. Um, so we use cross contact um, for referencing when gluten has been in contact with gluten free food. Um, so we have to be careful of using separate cutting boards, separate um, utensils, you know, so when you go to stir the pasta with regular pasta, you can't use the same spoon to stir gluten free pasta. Mm -hmm. So those are the ways in which we have to live our lives every day, mm -hmm. um, as well as what we put in our mouths with medications, chapstick. Um, so anything that goes in the mouth, we have to make sure is gluten free. It's almost the same thing because I've, I've done culinary uh, so basically, if you have a cutting board, almost the same is uh, you can't put raw product with cook, with cooked product on the same cutting board because you're going to cross contaminate that area. So yeah, you got it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, uh, go ahead. Did you want to ask a question, Arlene? Is this disease what? Treatable. I didn't get that. Um, can you refrain? Did you hear what she said? It, is she asking if it's curable? Is it? Yeah. Is this disease curable? I, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. Is this disease curable? Is celiac curable in any way? At the time, no. The only treatment is the, the gluten-free diet. It doesn't work. Um, it works for the majority of people, but it's also a really hard diet to understand. There is a lot more interest lately uh, with pharmaceutical treatments. The goal is always a cure, but they're aiming a little lower um, to see if the more achievable goal could be um, getting away or treating episodes of cross contact. So let's say going out to eat can be challenging for a lot of people. How, so and, how can it be challenging? Can you explain yeah, that? Yes. So, so you're basically putting your life in somebody else's hands when they're going out back and preparing food for you. And it's not really, a, that may sound dramatic, but for some people, very small exposure can result in a hospitalization. So, um, really? Oh, wow. uh, yep. And it, it depends on the body system. Some people don't recognize, some people are called asymptomatic where they don't have gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, but their body has been stricken with osteoporosis from malabsorption. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the ways in which it can affect certain people. Um, however, so yeah, dining out at a restaurant, you have to be good about calling ahead, see if they can safely prepare gluten-free food, you know, keep it separate from the gluten-containing food every step of the way. And that's throughout the dining experience in the back of the kitchen. Mm. So as you know, Lawrence, working in the culinary department, there can be a lot that, that goes on back there. <laughs> yeah, like for example, if someone is uh, vegetarian, People get kind of scared. Okay, is my food going to be cross contamination with meat, and, and that can be an issue too. Uh, which brings me to this important question: um, What are, uh, or it, I know we're kind of jumping here, but what That's is okay. what is the anxiety or emotional complications with celiac disease, or people getting scared or afraid? Um, if I may put it in that context as well. Yes, so this is twofold. First, talking about the physiological or biological changes that happen in someone with celiac disease as a result of the breakdown of the lining of their small intestine and the malnutrition that happens. Anxiety and depression are actually two symptoms of celiac disease. 
Mm -hmm. And that's because of the chemical changes that happen as a result of malnutrition. Explain, then, explain what you mean by the chemical changes. Um, so sometimes because of uh, nutrient deficiencies. Um, and my background is in occupational therapy. I'm a clinical educator. All of the resources that we have are medically vetted by our nutrition and dietary advisors. So anything that I'm explaining right now is based on those resources um, and my knowledge as a clinical ed educator. So uh, basically sometimes because of vitamin and mineral deficiencies, it can affect brain chemistry and that can cause anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. But then you factor in all the psychosocial and emotional things that people have to deal with walking out of their house and being able to eat safely. Mm -hmm. um, so that does result in feelings of isolation. You know, think of how much food is involved in society and our social interactions at holiday parties, work outings, travel, um, oh, no, I have girl and boy scout meetings. Right. I have another question. Talking about travel, the airline industry or the food industry within the airlines, when people travel long distances, they get a meal. Can a person request gluten free options or is there a problem with the airline industry or the travel industry in that respect? So actually, we just got back from our long overseas trip to Italy, and there's work that you have to do to make sure you get gluten-free food. It depends on the airline. So we were able to get a gluten-free meal and snack on the long flight over. Um, you always have to be prepared, and it's something we educate our community about because sometimes mix-ups happen. Your food might not be available. There might have been a mistake in preparing it. So you still have to pack that non-perishable food in your backpack, which is what we use as strategies. I yeah, just in case. Um, right. Um, now, what uh, what is, okay, how does celiac disease differ from a, a gluten-free or wheat allergy? Good question. Yeah. Uh, so celiac disease affects one type and one part of the immune system. A gluten intolerance or a, an allergy affects the different a different part of the immune system where it's a more with an allergy it's a more immediate uh, reaction and it affects that other part of the immune system celiac disease is the autoimmune condition uh, that affects you know your IgA antibodies and, and oh, okay back up a little bit here we're try, gonna try to make it simpler for our viewers what is IgA Sorry. No, it's fine. What is IgA antibodies within this? Sure. And honestly, I, if I could go back, because a lot, I, one question that might be helpful to answer is how do you get diagnosed for celiac disease? Because this is a really important topic. It's really important that people don't give up gluten or try the gluten free diet without being ruled out for celiac disease, mm -hmm. because it affects about 1% of the population. And about 80% of those people don't know that they have it. So, and in, in what happens is you get tested. The first test for celiac disease is for antibodies. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the branch of the immune system that I was talking about. And it's IgA. It's just a type of antibody that's produced. Those are the, you know, the fighter cells that say, oh, you shouldn't be there. And the antibodies are produced. Mm -hmm. And that's what's measured in your blood. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if those are positive, you really need to see a gastroenterologist to have a biopsy. So a tube would go down your throat. They would take a look with a camera and take little snippets of your small intestine. Um, and it, it's not a bad test. And that's how you, that's the gold standard to get diagnosed in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's again, but that's not going to be an accurate test if you've already started the gluten-free diet, you really need to continue eating gluten the whole diagnostic process. So mm -hmm. does that answer both questions? Um, uh, yes, it does. Arlene, did you want to ask a question? Go ahead. Sure. Um, um, take, take your time. Um, what, what type is one to do this disease? Okay, can you repeat the question, please? 
What what my wife's question is: What really causes the person to get the disease? They don't know. They have related it to a virus. There is one virus, and they're looking into more that may change the immune system. Um, they're theorizing. So here's this is a definite. This is a new research on the microbiome. So the bacteria in your body. Um, can go out of whack, and they're measuring a lot of bacteria in people to see if that's part of the equation. Um, stress, they're, they're measuring a whole lot of different indicators that might, it's like a light switch of what's going to kick on the gene um, to start being active, because it can happen at any time in your life that the gene can can be activated. Mm -hmm. Now, talking about genes and uh, vaccines, I, I, I know we didn't discuss this question, but since we're in the COVID situation and people are getting their vaccines, um, ha, uh, is gluten in any way, because really people, I mean, Everybody got their vaccines, but is gluten in any way in vaccines? And do people, like uh, vaccines or inoculations, and do people have to be careful of that as well? Am I saying that right? Yeah, that's actually a, a common question um, because we do have to be careful of what we put in our mouth for medications. Typically, gluten is not in vaccines. Okay. Um, and well, what about aspirins in. or anything, uh, uh, Advil's or any any aspirins or over-the-counter medications? Do you do, do people have to be weary of looking at labels to see what is in, you know? Excellent question. So that's probably a more in-depth answer. Yes. In general, the FDA finds that it is rare for gluten to be. Um, in as an additive because they add things as binders and fillers. However, it is still important that it is investigated, especially if you're taking a lot of a particular medication or multiple times a day. Mm -hmm. um, anything that you do put into your mouth, you need to be sure that it is gluten free. And that's, and you know, you asked about labeling earlier. Um, and there is an F, uh, a labeling rule for the term gluten-free under FDA. Mm -hmm. However, it doesn't apply to medications. Mm -hmm. uh, whether is there a reason for that? Is there a reason it, for that? Uh, jurisdiction, I guess, but also uh, it's a very big topic, food versus medications versus over-the-counter. There are a lot of different parties involved, and it's a lot to get any sort of legislation through because it, it's a lot of work. So. Okay. Now, uh, we're going to mention this question, but before we do that, uh, uh, there's a question about special needs and celiac. But before we do that, um, and talking about food pantries, okay, you wanted to educate um, why is it important um, for food pantries to have more gluten-free options, and if they don't, how can we educate the, uh, the public on that uh, situation? This is really, really important. So uh, statistically speaking, one in six people with celiac disease are experiencing food insecurity. Mm -hmm. So if, if you can imagine that you have this chronic lifelong condition that is quite serious and the only treatment is food related and that treatment is not covered by insurance it's not subsidized and it's about two times more expensive than all the rest of the food that everybody else eats and sometimes much more expensive than two times so explain people, a little bit more about that can you go in depth about that situation? Uh, why food is more expensive? Yeah. Well, is gluten free? Let's see if I can. Is gluten free food more expensive than normal regular food? Yes, unfortunately. And um, so, 
one study done, it was 183% more expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and so if that's your only treatment and you are already experiencing financial hardship, even having to skip meals, and then all of a sudden you or your child or family member was diagnosed, how do you think you're going to afford gluten-free food now? Um, so we tried to do a lot of basic education on, on getting naturally gluten-free foods, mm -hmm. fruits, vegetables, un undressed meats, unadorned meats, um, dairy, gluten-free nuts and seeds. So we have a cookbook to um, help people understand how to prepare food. And then, like you've mentioned a couple times, processed gluten-free foods. You know, everybody deserves to have some gluten-free bread, cereal. Um, you know, send your kid to school with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich if you don't have a peanut allergy. So with food insecurity, these are the, the areas where people don't have access to gluten-free food. One of, the, one of the biggest things that it's gluten-free, my wife and I are Jewish, and matzah, is gluten-free a lot of times because they they use some brands use gluten-free uh, you know flour because uh, because it doesn't rise during um, Passover so that's a, a good way of uh, thinking now culturally um, uh, if I'm saying this right is, is there more gluten-free allergies within uh, because you have like in certain religions there are challah bread, pita bread in, in certain countries are uh, is celiac more prevalent in other countries than am I saying it right? Yeah, yeah so uh, there have been full long talks about the prevalence of celiac disease throughout the world and there are definitely certain areas of the world where it's more prevalent. Um, but in general, celiac disease doesn't discriminate very much. Obviously, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but uh, you know, a lot of it does have to do with exposure to wheat and gluten in crops. Mm -hmm. So um, in India, the, there's a high celiac population in Europe. The Scandinavian countries have a high population of celiac disease. Um, so I would have to pull up direct references as to the percentages, but in general, that's... Okay. Um, did you want to ask any more questions, Arlie? Uh, yeah, this is my last question. Um, I'm trying to think of the Okay. Can you can you repeat that question, please? Is there a way? Let me rephrase my wife's question. Is there a way besides um, besides all the education that your organization provides? Is there a, a way for people to get counseling for uh, or counseling resources to have people deal, uh, deal with celiac disease, if I'm saying that correctly? Yeah, so it is recommended that people see a registered dietitian who's knowledgeable in celiac disease. It's really, really important that um, follow-up care is given. So when someone's diagnosed, they can, it's potential that they have other um, malnutrition-related malnutrition illnesses or deficiencies. So they need blood work done. They need vitamin D levels, B12, iron, folate. They need all those levels um, monitored and with a registered dietitian so they can get back to a state of good health um, you also need a bone density scan. So you really need good medical uh, follow-up. And then peers, peer support is so important. And that's what we do at NCA because we have support groups both virtually and in person. Um, and it's really about getting through the day-to-day -day and learning the disease, learning the diet, um, and and 
and just it's totally possible and there's so many amazing ways to adapt mm -hmm. and to live a healthy life and we like to try and um, make sure people know that it's it's definitely how, possible okay um how is one the question we did not ask uh, two some two questions here we did not what um is celiac disease considered a special need or disability why or why not yes it is considered a disability it is covered under the americans with disability act because it affects a major bodily function uh such as eating and uh, it affects the the functional system of the gastrointestinal tract mm -hmm. uh, now <clears throat> What are the misconceptions around people with celiac disease? Oh, Lawrence, how much time do we have? <laughs> 16 minutes, but if, we, if, if you want to go a couple of more minutes, go right ahead. No, that's okay. Um, no, 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 it's so, fine. We can make it longer if we need to. Okay. Some of the misconceptions is that it's not a serious disease. Be so because the treatment is a gluten-free diet, people don't think it's serious and be, you know the fad diet of gluten free has been beneficial and that it's gotten a lot more products to the market uh, but at the same time um, there's this this sense of joking um, take your you know, time take your time yeah go ahead in hollywood you know we're Sometimes the butt of jokes um, in well, how programs. so? How 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 is that? And how does the media play on uh, this disease? Um, so you know, there's been certain commercials in the past that have made fun of people who need to eat gluten free. There was a recent TV show that aired that I'm I, I'm not going to mention any networks or anything like that, but um, you know, it was these two teenage girls who were walking around and on this TV show and said, oh, why do we have to do what she wants to do just because she supposedly need, had celiac disease? Why do we always have to go to her restaurant? And um, it's a really serious disease. People get very, very ill um, and it affects your entire life. Mm -hmm. I know people who have been hospitalized on a regular basis. Now, um, uh, speaking speaking about restaurants, I know we didn't answer. Uh, well, you mentioned cooking in restaurants, and, and right? But do restaurants or have restaurants in the past, present, or future, uh, or going into the future, um, do they have gluten-free menus? Um, are they working on those things? Like, what if someone goes into a fast food restaurant? How does that, um, you know, deal with things? Everything is actually individualized as far as how restaurants are educated and how they choose to run their restaurant. Um, there are certain restaurants that are very, very good at it, and they cater to the highest need of people with celiac disease and um, a lot of allergies. Mm -hmm. And so they put very clear statements on their menu, and they're willing to talk about what they do in the back end, on the behind the scenes, to make the meal safe. Mm -hmm. There are other restaurants who say they can offer gluten-free items but it's not safe for people with celiac disease because they don't um, go to the measures they need to take for people uh, with celiac disease to avoid cross contact. And then others just don't offer. So at the end of the day, we do our best to help educate people how to be their own best advocates mm -hmm. and know how to talk to people at restaurants and to get their needs met. Mm -hmm. um, um, and the last question, uh, did you want to ask any more questions, Arlene? No, not at this moment. Okay. Um, what are uh, what are some of the activities that you do to educate within your organization with uh, celiac? And then the last question is, what are your future goals within your organization? We didn't mention your cookbook, but we can. Uh, you know, uh, we can do a set, um, we can do uh, another question for that. So let's start with 
um, some of the act what are some of the activities that your agency is doing? Great. Yeah, sure. So we host regular webinars with the Celiac Research Center at Harvard Medical School. Harvard, yeah. And uh, we they're all available for free via um, our on our website. You said Harvard uh, Medical School. Yes. Okay. Yep. So we partner with the Celiac Research Center at Harvard Medical Program. Um, to put on these webinars, mm -hmm. and they're a great resource. They're a hub of celiac research, and again, all the webinars are recorded, and they're available for free watching on our website, mm -hmm. um, as well as when we host them live. We do national support group meetings the second Tuesday of every month, as well as in-person meetings around the nation hosted by our volunteers on the ground. Um, we have amazing resources in our magazine, our free monthly newsletter, which is really great because there's recipes, but then there's also re a recall page because you talked about labeling and um, uh, sometimes there are misbranded items that say gluten-free, but they have gluten-free on the back mm -hmm. side um, in the ingredients. So that's why it's important to learn how to read labels. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um... So, and what are your future goals um, within the, or, like, future goals within the organization? Yeah, so with our programs like Feeding Gluten-Free, which is our national response uh, to food insecurity, the goals are to increase access to gluten-free food. We have um, expressed our opinions and tried to raise our voices at the White House um, for the White House strategy on hunger and nutrition and health that was launched at the end of September. Um, and, and so we hope to move the needle on improving access or decreasing the cost of gluten-free food. Mm -hmm. um, and as well as increasing education in the medical community to decrease the amount of time it takes for people to be diagnosed with celiac disease because there are so many potential symptoms, mm -hmm. or none at all. Um, it's really hard for people to get diagnosed. It's on average, I think, eight to 10 years it takes people to get diagnosed and dealing with that illness. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you... no, we have other goals and, and, and a lot more to do every day. I wish we didn't have to. I wish there was a cure. <laughs> mm. um, Let, uh, while we still have some time left, we have about nine minutes left, let's um, talk about uh, your cookbook um, that we did not really talk about. What type of recipes are in that cookbook um, for people to um, log? Is it on your website or do people have to order it? How does that work? Yes, our cookbook is called Thrifty Gluten Free. It is on our website um, available for purchase. Mm -hmm. And of course, all purchases go back to the proceeds go back to our programming. Um, and so we focus on yummy and um, economically feasible gluten free meals. Mm -hmm. And uh, the person who wrote it did a really great job. And um, the pictures are um, are taken with our cameras, and and so it's um, we we've made the meals. Basically, we know that they're they're tasty and economical. Okay, well, uh, we would like to thank the National Celiac Association for joining us on uh, this edition of Able Den on Air. Um, we would like to thank Carla uh, Carla Carter. Uh, for joining us, um, who is the Outreach Coordinator for the National Celiac Association. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, for more information on the National Celiac Association, where, where can people um, go on the website? Yes, our website is nationalceliac.org, and it's nationalceliac.org, and you can follow us on social media with our handle is at National celiac uh, and there's a lot of information on our website and I really appreciate your time Lawrence and Arlene um, and Abled on Air and the folks at Orca Media. 
Okay, so for more information on the National Celiac Association, their cookbook, and any other activities that they have uh, to make your life uh, more easier with uh, celiac disease, you can go to www.nationalceliacassociation.org. And um, just so people, go ahead. It's nationalceliac.org. I'm sorry. National, okay. for more information, you can go to www.nationalceliac.org. And for people who don't know, how do you spell celiac when they're on the website? C-E-L-I-A-C. Okay. So it's www.nationalceliac.org. That's C-E-L-I-A-C. Dot org. Again, C-E-L-I-A-C dot org. I'm Lauren Seiler. Thank you to our sponsors, Washington okay. County Mental Health, Green Mountain Support Services, and our partner today, the National Celiac Association. Um, I'm Lauren Seiler. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time on the next edition of Able Done On Air. Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to live home in the community, Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press, Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Able Den On Air has been seen in the following publications, Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, Boston, New England, Chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists.